The premise of your speech is not necessarily the title. The title of my speech was Million Dollar Words Speaking for Results. That's PR. You often write the title of your speech for copy months before you write the speech. <laughs> so my premise really is even dedicated Toastmasters can be even more effective at preparing and presenting powerful programs, which leads to the question, how? By understanding in depth the three necessary ingredients. So what I encourage you to do is write down your premise, your one sentence, as you're working on your speech. You might have it on the table next to you, just so you clearly know your message. Not long ago, I gave a speech for treasury professionals, and the speech title was called Selling Yourself and Your Ideas to Upper Management. And the objective of the speech, the premise that I stated was, every treasury professional can sell themselves and their ideas to the upper management. How? By using Fripp's tips. <laughs> success strategies. So it was success strategy one, two, and three. Very easy to remember. Not that long ago, I gave a speech for my Continental Breakfast Club. This is a group I speak for every year. I've given 17 different talks for them. The talk was called My Love Affair with the Movies, colon, Life Lessons from Movie Stars in Hollywood. Now, I didn't state it, but in my mind, my premise was there are life lessons and business lessons we can learn from movie stars. So after my opening, I just restrated the title because not everybody reads the program. <laughs> and then if you think of my three lines, my three points of wisdoms with the circle, the first row was movie stars I've met and the life lessons. Next row was movie stars my friend Scott McCain interviewed and the life lessons. And the third one was Hollywood as a business model and the lessons we can learn from business. And that was a speech I've only given a couple of times, but I put it together in that formula. So as I am walking across stage, I think I'm now at the end of row one. Now, as I walk back on the transition to line two, I'm thinking Scott McCain, and I go through, it makes it easy for you to remember it. So, after you've got your premise, after you've got the outline, there are many theatrical choices again in how you use the structure. I'm going to give you four easy ways this evening. First one, what I call once upon a time technique. In other words, you start at the logical start. Perhaps it's a timeline of your life. Let us imagine I'm giving a speech this evening called Opportunity Does Not Knock Once. And you will see what I mean by the once upon a time timeline. So will you give me applause and I will start this speech. <laughs> I know you're wondering, how does a hairstylist get to be a speaker invited to speak at an international Toastmaster convention? <laughs> well, I did it by doing one simple thing. And if you do this same thing, you can get anything you want in your life. I took advantage of opportunity. An opportunity does not knock once, opportunity knocks all the time. We don't always recognize the sound. I did something as a young 15-year-old shampoo girl that over the years I have turned into an art form. Very simply, I asked questions. In this posh salon in England, we would have these rich, glamorous women as customers, and as soon as I got to know them, I used to say, what were you doing when you were my age? How did you make your money? 
Did you make it yourself or did you marry it? <laughs> if you made it yourself, how'd you do? If you married it, where did you meet him? <laughs> Good market research. My brother says, sister, you ask people such personal questions. But 24 years behind a hairstyling chair and years of going to conferences, no one has ever said, that's none of your damn business. <laughs> people love talking about themselves. 23 years old, I find myself in the financial district of San Francisco, working in one of the first men's hairstyling salons. And I would say to my executive clients, just like you, what made you the best salesperson in your company? What did you do to your little company that a big company wanted to pay you millions of dollars to buy it? In fact, think about this. If you had a multi-millionaire all to yourself for 45 minutes, what would you ask? How about a top salesperson who made $200,000 a year in 1972? Or a trial lawyer who would explain his unprecedented, his strategies for win unprecedented awards? That was an average day for me before 10 a.m. when I owned my hairstyling salon in the financial district. I said to my staff one day, you are interesting women. Why do you talk such a load of drivel <laughs> when you have the most fascinating minds in the city? You see, the key to connection is conversation. The secret of conversation is to ask questions. The quality of the information you receive depends on the quality of your questions. And every time you have the opportunity to ask questions, you have the opportunity to grow. I was 30 years old when I opened my own hairstyling salon. My very first day, very first week, one of my multi-millionaire clients, Manny Lozano, sat in my chair and gave me advice. And I don't know about you, but when multi-millionaires give me advice, I usually try and remember it. He said, Patricia, I don't care when you can't squeeze another stylist in this salon. I don't care when you can't get another client on your appointment calendar. You still keep promoting because you always have to resell the customers you have. This is still the place to come. And you resell your staff, at least for this point in time, this is where they want to work. You see, if life is a series of sales situations, the real sale comes after the sale.